Let's bow our hands. Father in heaven, we have come together now in this place, on this channel, in this Zoom, to seek your face, to connect with you. Some are asking, Lord, uh, for a deeper connection. Others are asking for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit. Others, Father, are asking for direction from you, where to go, how this life might lead them, how your spirit might guide them. We pray, Father, that as we contemplate your word today, that you would show us how to connect with you so that we can understand the power of your salvation, where to connect with you, so that we might experience the power of your salvation. We beg these things now, Father, in your Son's most holy name. Amen. I would turn your attention uh, to the scripture that was read uh, for us by Carla. Thank you, Carla, for doing that. Uh, there is some context to the scripture. Um, I ask that you would go to Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33. We'll be there for the remainder of our time. Uh, but, but I would like to give you some context of what happens in Exodus 33. In Exodus 33, God is upset with his people. He is frustrated with his people. He decides he's going to leave his people. Can you imagine God deciding to leave you? His people are met with this in the 33rd chapter of Exodus. But there's reason for this. You would see that in a verse, uh, chapter rather, chapter 31, Moses is up on the mountain. Uh, God is giving him instruction of the sanctuary that needs to be built so that he can be with his people. And then God says, Moses, go down the mountain because something is wrong at the bottom of the mountain. And when he gets down there in chapter 32, Aaron has been busy building a golden calf. They are worshiping a golden calf because they have not seen Moses for a long time now, and they don't know what happened to him, and so they have made their own God. And they're worshiping celebration and, and decadence. And when Moses and Joshua come down the mountain, as Carla read for us, we find that there's noise that comes into their ears. And Joshua thinks it's a war, that they're being attacked. But, but Moses says, no, this is celebration. And when Moses comes down and he sees what's there, remember, he has the Ten Commandments written by God in his hands. And he allows the anger of what the people did to cause him to break God's law. He throws them down to the ground. They're broken in pieces. He questions Aaron. Aaron tries to defend himself. It's a mess. God's word is broken. God's law is broken. The people are worshiping idols and God is far from them. And in chapter 33 now, we see that they find themselves in a big mess. And God says at the very beginning of this in chapter three, look at verse one. And the Lord said unto Moses, depart and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought out of the land of Egypt unto the land which I swear unto Abram and to Isaac and to Jacob saying, unto thy seed will I give it, and I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, and the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Pezzarite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. For I will not go up in the midst of thee. Thou art a stiff-necked people. I'm going to give you what I promised. I'm going to give you what you asked for, but because your sin has separated you from me, I'm going to stay here while you go there. I, 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 I'm going to, 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 to give you what I promised. I'm going to work it out for your son. I'm going to work it out for your husband. I'm going to work it out on the job. I'm going to work it out for your daughter. I'm going to work it out for your marriage. But the way you're going, I'm not walking with you anymore. God providing promises, go ahead, I've prepared a land for you, go ahead, you're finally now going to be over Jordan, but I won't be there. 
There is no hope, the Bible says, when we are without God. And the people are frightened now. As a result of this separation, we find in chapter 33 and the seventh verse that Moses does something peculiar. Look at what it says. And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, meaning outside the camp, afar off from the camp and called it the tabernacle of congregation. In other versions, uh, uh, it, it, it's showing you here that it's called the tent of meeting. That if you are to meet God, if you are to turn to God, if you are to seek God, if you are to go to God, you're going to have to go to the tent of meeting. Uh, it, it is not in the camp. It's not right by your house. You will need to travel a distance to go there. But if you want to meet God, if you want to see his glory, if you want to understand him, if you want to understand the power of his salvation with all the things you're dealing with right now, what Moses is telling you by moving this, uh, a tent from the people to far away is that you might be in a mess. God may not be happy with you, but if you want to see God, you better go and meet him in the tent of meeting. You're going to have to decide, I want to see God. I need to see God. I've got to ask God to work this out, and I've got to go to the tent of meeting. Moses himself decides, these people may not go, but I'm going to go to the tent of meeting. And he walks to the tent of meeting. Verse 8, and it came to pass when Moses went out, of, uh, out onto the tabernacle that all the people rose up now, and they wanted to see now, if he goes out there, is God going to meet him? Because God has told us that he's not going to go into Canaan with us. And he's not going to go into the promised land with us. That would be like you and me waiting for Jesus to come to take us to glory. And he drops us off in front of glory and leaves. That we would be in heaven without him for an eternity. That would be, that would be, an, uh, that would be foolish for us to, to desire that. It would be the antithesis of what we have been waiting for. It would be the opposite of what our hopes have been bent on as, as people who believe in the second advent. And, and so now their leader, their intercessor between them and God goes out to meet God. And they want to see, will God actually meet with Moses? Look, look at what it says. It came to pass when Moses went out of the tabernacle that the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, as Moses entered into the, the tent of meeting, as Moses went to the place to meet God, that a cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talk to Moses. The Lord met him there, that when you go out of your way to meet the Lord, he goes out of his way to meet you. It doesn't matter if you've broken his covenant. It doesn't matter if things were unfair. It doesn't matter about the chaos in your life, in your community, on the job, in your family, in your marriage, that when you go out to meet God at the tent of meeting, he shows you the power of of his salvation. He first shows up. A lot of us are asking, we want God to show up in our lives. You better go and show up at the tent of meeting. You better go where God expects to see you. You know, I wonder, I wonder that if Adam and Eve, I just wonder God comes and meets them in the cool of the day, every day. But when he comes this one time, they're hiding in the bushes, uh, uh, ashamed and covered with their guilt. I, and I wonder if they, in their sin, went and sought God in the cool of the day, I called for him, if things would have been different. I, I wonder if their disposition towards God was different, if God would have been different to them. I, I wonder... When we go out to meet God, what happens? Well, Moses goes out to meet God. 
And God shows up and speaks to Moses. And there's some dialogue that takes place here. You look at verse 11, and the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh to his friend. And the dialogue that takes place there is what I want to talk to you about today. Here we are on the tail end of 2020, a ravaged year, an incredible year, but you are here. You're still here. You're still alive. You're still protected. You, you still have been shown mercy by God. You have seen uh, God's name glorified because of what he has done. You have been able to call on him. You understand the goodness of God. You are here. Your children are here. Your family members are here. You, you, I know some of us know folk, dear folk, who have been lost to this that are still dealing with COVID and other folk who are dealing with uh, the other things that have taken place in this year with the imbalance of, of, of brutality against others and cultural warfare that has happened and the political landscape have separated some of us. I, I know all of that is here, but God is also here and proof of his goodness and proof of his presence and proof of his grace and proof of his mercy is that you are here. And I just wonder, since God has done that, if in the middle of your chaos, you would be willing, you would be brave enough to go and meet him in the tent of meeting. There is a beautiful dialogue that takes place between God and Moses when he goes to meet him. And I believe that's exactly what takes place when you go and meet him when I go and meet him. And I wanna direct your attention to verse 17. Some dialogue has taken place so far. Moses has said, listen, I don't want you to send us up there if you're not gonna come with us now. I, I, I need to know what your plans are. And God says, uh, I, I will do what you ask. Look at verse 17. The Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken. For thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. I know everything about you. You don't take me by surprise. Your challenges, I knew of them before I allowed them to come. 2020, I saw it all before I allowed it to come. But your response to me in the middle of 2020, your response to me in the middle of the pandemic, your response to me in the middle of the chaotic imbalance, your response to me, whew, now I know who you are. You're my child. I, I know you by name. And Moses gets such a feeling of, of intimate connection with God here that he gets bold enough to ask God something. And look at what he asks in verse 18. And he says, I beseech thee, I, I, I beg of thee. I, I wonder if you would be kind enough, Lord, since you have said you're going to do all these things for me and you're going to take care of my family and you're going to take care of your people and we're going to be protected. I, could you show me your glory? Unless you believe that God's glory is only about the light that is around him, God's answer in the affirmative in verse 19 tells you, I want you to see what it is. Look. And he, God speaking, said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. I will proclaim my name the Lord before thee. I, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. Let me let you know that you this year, if no other time at all, this year you have seen the glory of God. God's response is my glory is made up of my goodness. All the good things that I do is my glory. Uh, 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 he says that when, when you hear my name proclaimed, when you hear my name called on, that is my glory. When 
When you hear testimony about what I've done, that is my glory. When you see my graciousness, when you hear of and see my mercy, all of this is my glory, my goodness, my name, my mercy, my, my grace. This is my glory. I will let you see it in the affirmative. He says, yes, I'm going to show it to you. You're asking for some things in your family. I'm going to show you my glory. You're asking for some things on the job. I'm going to show you my glory. You're asking for some things in your community, in your marriage, uh, in your church. You're asking for some things, and I'm going to show you my glory, and it will come in the form of my name being testified about. It will come in the form of my goodness being experienced by others. It will come in the form of me being merciful, of me being gracious. Yes, Moses, I'll show you my glory. But then, if you jump down with me to verse 21, we recognize some things that must happen when you meet God and get the nerve to ask him to show you his glory. The first thing he says is, behold, I love this. I, I need you to understand. I, I need you to understand where Moses is. Moses traveled from the camp to the tent of meeting, wanting to meet God. And he met God there. The cloudy pillar came down at the door of the tent and God spoke to him face to face. And you would think that the place you need to meet God is at the tent of meeting. You would be half right. But when you get the nerve to ask God to do more for you than you imagine that you should be able to get from God, here's what God says in verse 21, behold, look now, look what I've prepared, behold, there is a place by me. The first way that God's going to show you his glory, he's going to show you, hey, I've prepared a place for you. Centuries after this writing, centuries later, Jesus would tell you, I go to prepare a place for you. That the place is there in God's glory. And here, centuries earlier, in speaking to Moses, God says, I know you came to the tent of meeting, but based on what you're asking, I need you to know I've got a place right next to me for you. Come here, son. Come here, daughter. Come here, child. I've got a place prepared next to me just for you. And it's from this place next to me that I'm going to show you my glory. So if you don't want to get too close to God, don't you ask him about your glory. But if you want to get tight with God, if you want to get uh, intimate with God, if you want God to know you by name and you want to understand his full experience, just ask him, God, today, show me your glory. And he'll say, come here, child. I've got a place right near me. Now, look, look, it doesn't end there. It says... Behold, there's a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon the rock. Ah, thou shalt stand upon the rock. I, I not only have a place for you, but the place that I have for you is a rock that will not move, that you can stand on. You and I know this. Uh, 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 the Lord's or rock in him, we hide a shelter in the time of storm. O oh, rock divine, the hymn says, O oh, refuge near, a shelter in the time of storm. Mighty rock in a weary land. There is a place next to God. And that place is the rock of ages, Jesus Christ. And, and, and you, you know the hymn, be very sure. Be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. Why? Because the place next to God, the rock next to God, the hymn says the rock is Jesus. Yes, he's the one. The rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure. Be very sure your anchor holds and grips 
the solid rock. When you ask for God's glory, he pulls him ne you next to him and he places you on top of the rock, Jesus or Savior. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. When you've got the nerve to go and meet God, where he planned to meet you and you ask him to show you his glory, he shows you the power of his salvation by pulling you near and standing you on the rock. But it doesn't end there. Sometimes, sometimes when you ask God to do something, you put your hand on your Kimbo and you look let me see you do this thing. Prove who you are, God. Stand up against my enemies, God. And God here says, I will show you my glory. I will stand up against your enemies. I'll solve your marriage. I'll solve the issue. I'll work it out for you. I'll put you next to me. I'll stand you on my son, Jesus. But I need you to know that I'm going to cover you while I work. You are not always going to see how God works it out. You are not going to, how he works it out should have been no consequence to you at all. That he works it out is all you need to worry about. And he says, while I show you my glory, I'm going to hide you in my son, Jesus. I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock. Just hide in Jesus. Don't you worry about what's happening in the pew next to you or the house next to you or the family next to you or the person next to you. I'll work it out. They may be your enemy now, but when I'm done, when I pull you out that cleft, you're going to see a completely different reality. Don't worry about the, the pain that you want them to go through. And, uh, you know, David asked, Lord, uh, uh, do this to my enemies and that to my enemies and let them feel the pain that they had planned for me. And, and God's response to Moses here is, I'll work it out, but you don't have to worry about how I'm going to do it or how other people would feel. Just stand next to me. Stand on the rock. In fact, stay right here in the cleft of the rock where I'm placing you. And trust me, everything is going to be all right. And so, so we, we find here that, that he is now going to show him his glory. But while he shows his glory, while he shows his goodness, while he shows his mercy, while he, he proclaims his name, while he does the godly thing so that his goodness is known, so that you might be feeling beaten down right now, but he does it in such a way that when, when other people see your problem, they hear the name of the Lord. When other people see your travail, they hear the name of the Lord. They hear about the goodness of God. When people see you, even though you feel that you're in a tough spot, when people see you, what they see is the glory of God, that they see the mercy of God. He covers you in his glory while he works is what you need to understand. And while my glory passeth by thee, look at what it says here in verse 22. And it shall come to pass that while my glory passeth by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock. While I work it out, I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock and, and not just put you in the cleft of the rock and, and leave you, but I'm not going anywhere now. While I pass by and you're in the cleft of the rock, I'm going to cover you with my hand. I, I believe in my son's Jesus ability to save. I, I believe that he's rock solid. And if you stay with him, you can be saved. I, I believe all of that, but, but I'm not going to leave it up just to my son. I, I love you so much that I want to be a part of it, that your problem that needs to be solved, even though you're hiding in Jesus right now, you're going to be covered by my hand while you're doing it. And while I work it out, I'm covering you in the righteousness of Jesus and in the protection of my arm. You better believe that when you go to meet God in the tent of meeting, that he shows the power of his salvation in his son, in his presence, by his protection. That's the experience you have with God. Now I got something else I want to show you. Uh, 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 
uh, look, look, it says here that when he covers with his hand, but uh, verse 20, verse 23 uh, uh, says, and I will take away mine hand, follow me now. When I'm done expressing my glory, when I'm done working it out, when I'm done solving the issue, I will take away mine hand and it's then that thou shall see my back parts. It's then that thou shall see my glory. You won't see my face. You won't see me while I'm working it out. But when you look back on the issue, you'll say, my goodness, God was there. When you look back on the marriage that was so rocky, you're going to say, my goodness, look how God saved us. When you look back on the children that seemed lost, you're going to say, God was a good God. When you look back on 2020, you will not be decrying the amount of people who got COVID or the amount of riots or the political upset, you're going to be looking back on 2020 and saying, look at the glory of God. When God is done with it, then he'll show you and you can see his glory. When you look back, I want you to think about your family. You know, just look back right now. You know, God has shown his glory. He's shown his goodness. You know, he's shown his mercy. He's shown his grace. He's done that for you. That's how you survived all of this foolishness. That's how you could hold on. God shows you his glory when he's done. He promises you what he will do. I will, I will, show you my glory. Uh, I will show you my goodness. I'm going to show you my mercy. I'm going to proclaim my name. I'm going to show you my justice. I'm going to work it out for you, but you, I will not show you how it's going to be done. Only that it will be done. And when I'm done, you will have no other option but to say, I went to meet the Lord and I saw the power of his salvation. I saw the glory of God. I, I just, I, I only have to show you the, the things that he's done in your life. Just talk to me about your children and you're talking about the glory of God. Talk to me about your family. You're talking to me about the glory of God. When you meet God, even in the middle of your foolishness, he still is good enough to show you his glory. And all I want to tell you right now, brethren, is just look at the place where you are. Is it chaotic? Is it troublesome? Is it something you can't figure out? Is it messed up? Is it full of people who seem like they're coming at you? Is it full of missed opportunities? Go meet God. Walk from where you are to the tent of meeting. Go meet God. It might be in your car. It might be in your closet. It might be down the hall. It might be in a room by yourself, but you better go meet God. And when you go, don't be shy. Come boldly before the throne of grace and say, God, I can't make it without seeing your glory. And watch what God does and watch what he tells you. I pray that you give yourself to God in this way, because when you go, you will experience the power of God's salvation. I know it. Bow your heads with me, please. Father in heaven, we thank you for being a kind of God that meets us even when we're messed up. We're thankful that you're the kind of God that shows your goodness, your grace, and your mercy, and proclaims your name to people who don't deserve it. We are thankful, Father, that in the middle of the mess, you put us in a firm place next to you, that you cover us in your son's robe of righteousness, that you cover us in the firm, uh, secure place of his salvation, and that you cover us with your hand. And Lord, that you work it out for us, no matter what it is. And we are glad, Lord, that you don't look back and see our sins. You look back and you see the cross. So now because of that, we can look back on 2020 and see your glory. Praise your name for everything that you have done to pull us where we are from where we were. We thank you, Father. Continue to be with us now. Bless us and keep us. Strengthen us. Forgive us. Save us now. This we ask in your son's name. Amen.